Well, welcome to June. I think it finally feels like it's going to warm up for us here in Winston. We're so glad you joined us. Um, you know, before we get started, we always have to thank our best, our the most amazing, I'm not going to say the best team, I'm going to say the most amazing team. We've got Tom Roth with our CTSI, Courtney Hayes, who is now with our Stick Center uh, Center on Aging, and of course, Audrey Belfaro with our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. But most of all, we thank you for being here. We have got a full show for you tonight, so we're just going to jump on in and get started. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, you know, I get requests from time to time about um, requests for different types of menu, different types of cooking classes. So I've had several that have said, hey, do something a little different, a little more exotic. So we have got Chef Adam Barnett at the new Powder Room Cafe restaurant in uh, kind of the West End area of Winston-Salem. And he's doing a fun kind of fancy spin on a chicken with gravy recipe. Now, for those of you who got the recipe, some of it's a little, well, I'm, I'm talking from a non-cook's perspective. Some of it seemed a little complex. And so I put little cheat sheets on there. Um, so anyway, without further ado, we're gonna ask Chef Adam to go ahead and show us how to make it. Thanks, Deb. We are really excited to be a part of the Aging Well series. My name is Angie Murphy and I handle the marketing and social media for the Powder Room. So welcome to the Powder Room. Let's step inside and Kim Lawson, our general manager, will give you a little tour of the place. Hello, welcome to the Powder Room Cafe. My name is Kim Lawson and I'm the general manager here. Uh, we have been open since October 2022. So I think we're around our seven month birthday. In addition to delicious coffee and a delicious cafe menu and small plates menu, we also serve beer, wine, and spirits. Um, our wine and beer are available for you to enjoy here in the cafe, outside on our covered patio, or in the comfort of your own home. We open at 8 a.m. Tuesday through Saturday um, we actually turn on the disco ball at 8 a.m., believe it or not. Uh, Tuesday through Thursday, we are open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Friday and Saturday, we are serving a small plates menu from 6 to 9 p.m. When we started working on this project, um, it was very important to us that the interior be over the top, super fun, super inspiring, uh, energetic lux. We just wanted to create an experience that we wanted to enjoy on Burke Street. Let's head over and meet uh, the chef, uh, Chef Adam Barnett. We're lucky enough to have him in the kitchen today. So he's gonna, I think he's put together something really special for you guys. So enjoy. Well, welcome to the powder room. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm the uh, consulting contract chef here takes care of the, uh, the little bits and pieces that I'm sure you saw sitting out in our lovely case. Um, this evening, we're going to work with a little bit of a French classic. Um, it's an Alsatian, kind of French Alsatian classic, roasted chicken with uh, spetzle. Um, if you think of spetzle, uh, think of it as, as kind of a, a little small, tiny, refined dumpling. It's a free-form dumpling that we're going to make. Um, and through the magic television, we're going to kind of go through the entire process. This evening, we're going to put uh, some spring vegetables with that. That's going to be sauteed in with the, the spatula. Yes. So uh, this is something that you can adjust seasonally. If it's uh, right now we're in the spring, so we've got some asparagus and some English peas. As you move on into the summer, it works well with chanterelle mushrooms and sweet corn. You move on into the fall, you know, you can do the little cipollini onions and butternut squash. And so it's a really, really diverse platform to work from. So it's not in the, in its core, not seasonally specific. It's, it's a very, very diverse, um, a diverse dish. We're going to finish this with a, a pan sauce. Now I call it a caramelized onion chicken gravy. Um, this is, I think we all know gravy, and, and we know gravy is delicious. Um, and I think that when you see this one, uh, we may we may change your mind on on the old-fashioned gravy. We may have we may have just found something that 
you can show your friends and, 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 really, and really blow them away. When you say you're going to have chicken, dumpling, and gravy, and you present this, I, I think that you're going to get some oohs and ahs. So what we do with this is we do it as a pan sauce. So we're going to sear this chicken, unilateral sear, skin side down only. And the idea being is, is we're going to develop what they call a fond, right? And that's the base on the, the bottom of the pan, little bits kind of fused to the pan. Well, when we take the bird out and we're going to deglaze with some homemade chicken stock, then we're going to add a caramelized onion puree to that, right? We're going to swirl that in, and that is going to act as the thickener. So think of the onion puree as your roux. And then we're going to finally finish it off with a little bit of a compound butter. So none of these are complex. This is all very easy. So we're going to take five or six very simple things, and we're going to create a great dish out of it. So let me start with the, the compound butter, because this is something that I think that every home cook uh, who really wants to take their food to a, to a whole other level should have a repertoire of three or four of these, right? Take a, just a simple pound of butter, get it nice and soft. If you've got a stand mixer, that works great. You can also do this with your hands. Um, this one here is roasted mushrooms with chives, parsley, shallots, and garlic, right? So all of that is then just folded into the butter. I roll that up. I put it into the freezer, put it into the refrigerator, just to get it to set up in a nice cylinder like this. I love this one. It's really, really, really highly, highly flavorful. You can do this with uh, a simple parsley and lemon. You can do it with uh, parsley, garlic, and shallots, and that's the maitre d' butter. Um, look up the recipe for the Café du Paris, um, which is a fantastic compound butter. Again, stick these in the freezer. When you're sauteing off some vegetables on a Tuesday night, this is going to take your vegetables to a whole new level. The Spetzle is, a, like I said, a freeform dumpling. Now, it's a, a series of very simple ingredients. For a batch approximately this size, two eggs, two and a quarter cups of milk, about an ounce, an ounce and a half of a nice Dijon mustard. Whole grain mustard works out really well as, as two. Um, two and a half cups of all-purpose flour with a little bit of salt. I do a pinch of salt. I know that whenever I pinch salt, I'm roughly pinching about four to five grams. Um, so two, three pinches in there. And then I just have some chopped up parsley. You're going to mix the wet ingredients, mix them all together until they're well incorporated, add the dry ingredients, and, and whisk the bejabbers out of it. And what you're looking for when you do that is something that's kind of like a thick pancake batter. Okay, um, You're going to eyeball this a little bit. Your eggs are going to be a little bit of a different size. Your AP flour is going to have a little bit of a different gluten content. And so, you know, some of this is going to be done by feel. That recipe is a very, very strong base recipe. And feel free to add ingredients into it. You want chives in there, scallions, uh, like anything. You can, you can kind of play around with it. The easy part about this is it, it requires a pot of water and a colander. So put your batter in the colander, press it through with a little rubber spatula. It falls into the boiling water. You cook it for about two minutes, take it out of the water, lay it out onto a tray, give it a little bit of oil, and your space is done, and that's it. Uh, it. Nothing is more simple than this. Um, with that being said, this is approximately what you're going to yield out of, out of this, maybe a little bit more, and this is the final product, okay? So moving down to our chicken, I like to buy just a whole three and a quarter pound chicken. Um, I think that it's fine if you want to go and you want to buy, you know, the, the boneless, skinless breasts and all that. That will work with this. I really think getting a whole chicken is the way to go for a couple. So now that we've got the chicken where we want it to be, season it, right? And we're going to go just a little bit of salt, a little bit of black pepper, and then this little trick of the trade, herbs de Provence. Um, I, this is a, such a great spice blend. Uh, you can find it at any of the major grocery stores now carry herbs de Provence. It used to be a little bit of a specialty store item. But you've got uh, a number of dried herbs in there. Um, you've got thyme. There's a little bit of rosemary. But you've got what's really, really nice in there is you've got lavender, right? Now, I'm not a huge, huge fan of using a lot of lavender in my cooking. Um, and the floral characteristics can be a little bit overpowering. But in this blend, it really, really works. It does bring out a little floral characteristic. Um, 
the, the, the aroma that it brings to the dish is fantastic. But the flavor itself is, it's, it's kind of a light yet very complex flavor profile. Um, works well in, with chicken. I use it on steaks, right? A little bit of olive oil, some herbs de Provence. It just adds another, another like layer of flavor that, that I think is, is just, it's really, really nice. So I season very, you know, with a nice liberal hand. Uh, and pepper, you know, barrage here. And then again, the herbs de Provence, right? So, one of the things that, that I've had a lot of people ask me the question about is cooking oil um, and whether or not I cook with olive oil. So, when I cook, if I'm sauteing something, I tend to use canola oil. Um, canola oil is very, very neutral. But it also has a very high smoke point. If you're cooking with an extra virgin olive oil, you're honestly you're wasting a lot of money. Um, you, what, what's going to happen with extra virgin olive oil is a lower smoke point. But once the oil gets hot, those acids start to burn, and any of the health benefits from extra virgin olive oil at that point are gone. The only it's it's far better to buy a, a higher end extra virgin olive oil, use it for finishing, dress your salad greens with it, and use canola oil or a grapeseed oil right, as your, as your everyday like workhorse cooking oil. So what we're going to do is we're going to sear this, and I do this in a nice heavy bottom pan. Okay. So we're going to get a little fire going. A fairly liberal amount of oil, okay, and we're going to let that get nice and hot, okay. So by liberal oil, you get a good coating, okay, and just a little bit more, okay. So I'm going to say if I was going to approximate that, I would say you're looking at two tablespoons plus a splash. Now we're going to wait until that gets nice and hot. Um, you're not looking to get to to the smoke point because that's going to create a that's going to create some bitterness in the dish later on, okay. Ideally speaking, oil is. When you start to notice the viscosity change in oil, it starts to move like water in a pan. That's always a good point to, that's a good point to hit your, to your protein in there. From my perspective, what I can see is I can see some shimmer in the oil, right? Now, you see how it is moving around that pan, right? It's swirling around like water, okay? So what I know now is I know that that's nice and hot, right? I can see a little bit of a shimmer to the, to the oil. Um, it's, it's, it moves exactly like a water would move. So what we're going to do is always lay away from you, right? So you lay away, the oil goes that way. So now I really don't mess with it, right? I want what I'm looking for is this to get nice and hot, right? We're going to get a nice caramelization on that skin. You can kind of see the oil pop, right? You can hear that sound. And so I love this dish because it starts to really does start to develop that, right? I can I can smell those herbs toasting, right? I can hear it crackling. I can see how the oil's moving. I can see the edges caramelizing up, right? What I will do from here is I'm gonna go right into an oven. I set my oven at roughly about 400 degrees. Now, what we have here is a convection oven, which increases the temperature at about 25 degrees. So a home oven, I would set it at about 415, 425 degrees, depending, right? A half chicken like this, once you sear it and put it in that oven, is gonna take about 15 minutes to cook, okay? So one of the, like, you, you don't wanna move it, don't flip it over, anything like that. Now, so with that, we'll go into the oven. Chicken's in the oven. Now, we're gonna just saute off some of the spatzle. Again, a little bit of canola oil. I like to do this in a nonstick pan. Right. Um, they work out really, really well for the spatzle. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a little bit of crispness to these. I like to have a little bit of, a touch of the kind of brown to them, right? And that's just, again, you're just, you're adding a little bit more flavor. A little caramelization is, is really nice with these. Yes. You can so, again, I've got a nice, right, viscosity to that, right, you hear the sizzle, and almost immediately I'm going to add my peas and I'm going to add 
my asparagus, right? You can just kind of move it around the pan. A good tool to have with you is a spoon and you can just, you can do this just to kind of move it. So, I'm going to put the tiniest amount of butter in there, literally like a little thumbnail, okay? So the trick with butter, right? Everybody always believes that French food is just laden with butter. The reality is, is that butter, when used at the very, very end, you use so little, right? But at the very, very end, if you just mount something with a little bit of butter, as soon as it melts, it coats, your palate gets all the benefits of that, right? Without having to load it up with butter. So, and I wish you could smell this. This is incredible, right? So, now I'm just going to spoon a little bit onto my plate, or I'm going to spoon a lot onto my plate. We're going to pull our chicken out. I'm going to show you what we mean when we talk about that unilateral cooking and what we achieve out of that. So, a couple of things. I never flipped it over, okay? Look at that golden skin. Okay, so look, look at this golden skin, right? Just a beautiful, beautiful color, right? Whatsoever. So, last thing that we have to do is gravy. So, chicken is out on the plate. This is what we were talking about when we were talking about the fond, right? That is all flavor, okay? Very little, very little oil left in there, okay? So the pan is nice and hot, fresh out of the oven. We're going to take some of our homemade chicken stock, right? And I'm just going to use a spoon make sure that I get all those little bits up, right? You automatically get reduction, right? And reduction is going to concentrate those flavors. So what we have now is a really, really concentrated chicken jus, right? A nice spoonful of this onion puree to go in there, right? You can see the density of that. And all that is is just caramelized onions. You can use a little bit of broth or water. Put it in your high-speed blender and just go till it's smooth, right? You see, we've already got that gravy-like consistency, right? You can see the little... Now, I'm going to add, again, just a little bit of that compound butter in there. And all I'm going to do, you can swirl this around, right, over kind of low heat. All you're really doing at this point is just melting that butter in there, okay? Your gravy is made. You're just making it a little bit more exciting, okay? But now I've got I've got a beautiful gravy at this point, right? Lots of flavor going on in there. Okay. What I'm, so, we got a beautiful gravy here. Nice viscosity. Looks like mom's gravy. Right? And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to spread that around. Just like that. Right? And chicken and gravy. It really did smell wonderful. Y'all may remember that um, my husband and I are both uh, non meat eaters. We are pescatarian, but it smelled fabulous. So anyway, I hope you enjoy. I hope you try it. Again, I gave you a few little shortcuts 
on the recipe that I thought might help you. Um, it certainly would help me a little bit. Anyway, a friend of ours uh, at the Stick Center, Carlo Davids, is one of the most amazing young men. He got his master's in, um, let me make sure I'm saying it right, health and exercise science at Wake Forest University. And he is with our US Pointer Study, and he is going to share some stretching tips that are just, it's just good for relaxation as much as anything, but it sure feels good when you do some of these stretches. So I will turn it over to my friend, Carlo. So yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of the Aging Well series. Um, we, as you can see, we are in the backyard here and we can um, do these exercises anywhere and in any place that we want to do them. And so um, we want to make sure um, that we are going to uh, provide you with an opportunity to do stuff that you can do at home as well. Um, as, um, as an exercise physiologist, um, a lot of times what we focus on is getting people to do aerobic exercise, to do strength training. And what we sometimes forget is uh, really emphasizing that stretching component. And so for today's video, I was going to take a few minutes um, and just go through some stretches um, that you can do on your own. And we'll start with some breathing um, and then we'll move from the neck and we'll move all the way down the body um, as we go through them. Um, so if you're ready, grab your chair, uh, sit up and we will get going. So to start, I'll have you scoot a little forward in your chair, um, feet about shoulder width apart. And we, we're going to start with some breathing exercises. Um, these will be, the exercise will be today, to do that today, will be a little bit of an adaption um, from some yoga stretches that I've learned over the years. Um, and so um, I will just start with some breathing and then we'll get into the exercises. So what we'll do is we'll sit up nice and tall and we'll just take a deep breath. Hold it for one, two, three, and let it out. So you want to make sure you're taking a deep breath through your nose and breathing out through your mouth. And in, and out. That's two, and three in, and out. That's four, and in, and out. That's five, and last one in. And back out. So now that we are a little bit more relaxed and we're kind of comfortable, um, we're going to start with our neck stretches. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you sit up nice and tall again. And we'll only we'll start with some neck rolls. And what we'll do is we'll just start rotate, the rotating our neck from right to left. And we'll do these five times. So one, nice and slow. Make sure you get a full extension, the full range of motion two, all the way back around, and three, and four, and last one, five. So of course, if we go the one way, we have to go the other way too. So we'll go, uh, this time we'll go from right to left. And we'll go one, and two, and three, and four and five so the first few minutes here i'm really going to focus on the neck and the back of your shoulders and your chest and your back because i know right now we have a lot of stress going on so i want to just make sure that we get rid of some of that tension that we might have in those areas um, next what we'll do is we'll do some shoulder rolls and what, what that will entail is just rolling your shoulders all the way back, making as big a circle as you can with your shoulders. So, and we'll do the exact same. We'll do five each way. So we'll do five forward, and then we'll do five going backwards the other way. And one, so nice and big. And two, and three, and four, and five oh nice nice and loose that felt good early in the morning uh, next we'll go back and we go and one and two and three nice and big make sure you make as big a circle as you can and four and five um, so now that we've done all our deep breaths and we are um, nice and relaxed 
we'll start off by doing some stretches and we'll start at the neck and we'll move all the way down um, so the first one we'll do is we'll sit with our feet shoulder width apart um, sit up nice and tall relax your shoulders and what we'll do to start is just look to the side come back to the middle look to the other side once you're at that stretch hold it for one two three and then come back to the middle um, so we will do that to each side and we will do that five times to each side um, one just one little tip is when you when you look to the side you can actually um, get a bigger stretch if you just relax your shoulders and pull a little um, to the opposite side with the opposite hand um, and that's really going to work um, that neck muscles that you rotate um, we can also do the same thing we'll do the same thing afterwards um, and this time what we'll do is we will uh, rotate to the side this way um, and hold for one two three set up nice and tall one two three to the other side um, and so when we do these we want to make sure that we are relaxing our shoulders um, as we do the stretch similarly to the other one um, you can also enhance the stretch by once you lean over actually pulling down a little bit to stretch that neck a little bit more um, as well so those are some stretches for your for your neck um, and so right now a lot of us have a lot of tension in our shoulders tension in the neck because of all the stuff that's going on and all the stress we might have um, and so the next stretch is really going to help with some of that so you're going to sit in front of you in this in the seat of your chair and all you're going to do is you're going to hug yourself and you're going to try to extend and round your back as much as you can so you're going to hold it squeeze it extend that back hold it for one two three come back to the middle and then just go the opposite side interlock your hands and open up that chest as far as you can so one two three and we'll just do the same thing again we'll, we'll squeeze nice around that back one two three and stretch it at the back as well opening up that chest one two three so the same with this exercise um, you can do this one um, doing uh, three to five five times holding in the front and three to five times holding in the back um, as well the next exercise um, is going to be a lateral reach and that's really going to target these uh, muscles in your on the side your or your latissimus dorsi or your lats as everyone calls it um, and so this one all you're going to do is you're going to sit up tall you're going to reach up above your head and you are going to lean over to the side one and count for one two three come back to the middle nice and slowly try not to rush into the stretch nice and slowly reach over and extend that arm and try to push out that lat as much as you can and one two three um, the exact same thing with this exercise is that we will do this one holding it above into the stretch for three seconds and we will do it about three to five times um, going to each side um, the next stretch is one of my favorite stretches um, i'm from south africa so i call it the cat cow um, and so this is a this is one of those ones that's a modification um, on some of the yoga stretches so instead of going on all fours you can sit in your chair and i'll turn to the side for this one so you can see it a little better um, but you're going to sit in your chair nice and tall and um, but you're going to place your hands on your on your knees and you are just going to round your back as much as you can and you're going to hold that for one two three and then what you'll do is you'll slide those hands back and as you slide them back push your chest out try and arch your back as much as possible and look straight up into the air and hold that for one two three so once again you're just gonna roll forward hold that stretch right there one two three um, and then open up look up into the air one two three so that one feels probably the best out of all of them for me so uh, definitely one to keep an eye on um, one thing that i want to stress and something i might have missed earlier is that um, as we're doing these stretches try to always be breathing as well um, don't hold your breath um, during the stretches try to always have like a nice um, slow breathing rate but never hold your breath always try to keep breathing as you are doing them um, as well um, those are going to really be some basic stretches that can really target all the way from the top all the way down to the uh, the bottom of your body um, and so once again i want to thank deb for this opportunity to be here with you guys um, and and just share with the aging well series 
Um, and like, like, uh, like I said at the beginning, um, flexibility is really important and we can do it anywhere, uh, anytime. And hopefully uh, you benefited from this, but I really appreciate it and really enjoyed doing this for you guys. Thank you. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I was doing all those stretches with him and already it just feels so good. It just kind of gets all, some of the crinkles out. Well, I can honestly say by popular demand, I am thrilled to be presenting our next speaker. Dr. Grevin um, is both the professor and chair of ophthalmology at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. So many of you have asked for a session on eye health, what can we do to take the best care of our eyes? And so I'm just tickled that Dr. Grevin was able to join us and I'm really looking forward to hearing everything, every bit of advice he has for us. So anyway, Dr. Grevin, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Deb. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here tonight and um, I got pretty hungry during that first set, uh, set session that Chef Adam did, uh, but I think that uh, the amount of relaxation that came in with Carlo and all his flexibility exercises were great. Um, I'll start sharing my screen here. Um, let's see. Um, so tonight I'm gonna talk about common eye diseases and eye health. Obviously, in this short period of time, I'm not going to have the opportunity to uh, talk about all, all of the eye diseases because there's just tons of them and it could take weeks to do all of that, but I'm going to hit some of the highlights and um, want to start by saying uh, that I have no conflict of interest in anything I'm talking about tonight and no industry relationships to bias my presentation. Thought we'd start with some just some common misconceptions about eye diseases. And um, so some people think loss of vision only occurs in people as they age. Um, not true. Uh, eye examination should only occur if I have vision problems. Uh, that's not true either. Uh, there are some uh, conditions and diseases that are relatively asymptomatic until late in the course of the, of, uh, the disease. And so uh, we should be getting eye exams kind of on a routine basis, and I'll go over that. Uh, all vision issues can be corrected by just getting a stronger pr uh, prescription. Uh, again, not true, but uh, kind of a common misconception that folks have. If I can just get a better pair of glasses, I'll, I'll be better. And then uh, leading a healthy lifestyle will prevent me from having vision problems. And while leading a health, healthy lifestyle is really important in eye health, it doesn't necessarily prevent you from uh, uh, patients from having vision problems. Uh, just to talk a little bit about the prevalence of eye diseases, uh, vision loss can occur at any age from infancy to elderly. Uh, more than 1.6 million Americans less than 40 years of age have severe visual loss. So it can occur at any age. Uh, more than 4.2 million Americans aged 40 and older are either legally blind or are with low vision, and this increases with advanced age. And 20% of people aged 85 and older suffer from legal blindness in at least one eye. So um, it's a very appropriate topic for this Aging Well series. Uh, the most common uh, vision issue is our refractive errors, and these, uh, for the most part, can be corrected with glasses and or contact lenses, uh, and these are things that typically occur uh, young, when we're younger, like nearsightedness or myopia. Uh, lots of times people will um, not know that there are leaves on a tree until you're eight years old and you get an eye exam and get put in the appropriate uh, uh, prescription glasses. And then all of a sudden, this green blob out in front of you isn't a green blob anymore, but it has individual leaves. Hyperopia is another condition uh, or farsightedness. Uh, astigmatism is a little bit of irregularity of the cornea or lens, which causes, which again can be corrected in most cases with glasses. And then presbyopia 
is our inability to read as we age and the time that people who've never had to wear glasses in their life somewhere between 40 and 50 have to uh, put on reading glasses. Uh, these are these refractive errors can be corrected for the most part, like I said, and uh, don't are not irreversible causes of loss of vision, but things that can be fixed. Uh, the common eye diseases that I'm going to talk about tonight are cataracts, uh, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and glaucoma. And I thought before we went into any of these diseases, we would maybe do a little anatomy lesson. And um, I, I hope that uh, you all can see uh, the slides that I have, but the cornea uh, is to the right on the diagram that I'm showing. And the cornea is the clear front window of the eye. And the iris is the colored part of the eye. And in the center of the iris is the pupil. And that's where the light rays go through. Um, the lens sits behind uh, the iris. Uh, up toward the front of the eye. Then the eye is filled with jelly called the vitreous. And then the retina lines the inside layer of the eye and catches the light rays and sends signals back through the optic nerve to the brain. So our eye is our instrument of vision, but our brain is actually the uh, where everything is processed and where all uh, the vision actually occurs. Um, first thing I think we'll talk about is cataract, which is the leading cause of reversible blindness uh, or reversible loss of vision in our country. And uh, this picture on the left demonstrates, you can again see the cornea, the optic nerve here in the back, and this is the retina, and this is the lens. And when we're born, our lens is clear like a window. And as we age, uh, the lens becomes a, a little bit cloudier, and uh, with more advanced age, the lens can become quite cloudy and blur vision and blur the light rays getting back here to the retina. So that is what a cataract is. It's a yellowing of the lens. It's a normal aging process. It happens in everybody. Uh, there are congenital cataracts, so babies can be born with cataracts, but most of them are age-related. Um, for the past um, 70 years, we have been uh, doing cataract surgery and putting lens implants in the eye. So cataract surgery um, is done by making a small incision in the front part of the eye in the cornea. And then the, uh, the lens is scooped out, leaving the back layer of the lens. Uh, and then a, a a uh, synthetic lens is placed, as you can see on the uh, slide right. And this lens implant, they can be made of acrylic or silicone or polymethyl methacrylate, are put in what's called the capsular bag. And that holds the lens in position. And so the light rays are, not, are now directed right back to the retina. And um, that is how we fix cataracts. Um, I often get questions from patients about, can you get a cataract a second time? And the answer to that is you really don't get a, um, you can't get a second cataract, but there are secondary cataracts. And so what I mentioned earlier is when we take the cataract out, we leave the back layer of the human lens in, in position, and that is what supports the lens implant. And so the picture on the left shows that the lens implant, and you can see that these little, these little areas of blue here, that's how the lens is held in position. But behind the lens implant, this, this area back here has become cloudy, and that's a secondary cataract. Um, for the, it's ever since I've been in ophthalmology, which has been for the last almost 40 years, uh, that's when we developed a, a procedure called a YAG laser, where we can actually vaporize this cloudy part of the residual lens to open it up. So the light rays can now go straight through to the eye. This is an in-office procedure. It is, a, it is a type of surgery, but it is not something that you have to go to the operating room with. Cataract surgery is something that you have to go to the operating room with. 
Uh, so this is a secondary cataract, and um, and it's uh, very common after cataract surgery. At least fifty to seventy percent of patients after cataract surgery will require this procedure, which is called a YAG capsulotomy. Um, we're going to jump from the front of the eye, the the um, cataract, to age-related macular degeneration. And age-related macular degeneration is the most common cause of irreversible loss of vision over the in patients over the age of 60. So where cataracts are reversible uh, loss of vision and can be fixed, oftentimes with age-related macular degeneration, we're unable to uh, improve vision. Um, there are 30% uh, of people in their 70s will have some evidence of age-related macular degeneration, and 40% of people in their 80s have age-related macular degeneration, and nearly 50% of people in their 90s ha will have age-related macular degeneration of some type. I saw a couple of patients today that were both in their 90s, and neither of them had any macular degeneration, so it's not, um, not everybody gets it but it is, a, um, it is very common as we add more birthday candles to our birthday cake. In general, there are two kinds of age-related macular degeneration. There's dry macular degeneration and wet macular degeneration. Dry accounts for about 90% of all cases of macular degeneration, but only about 10% of people who lose significant vision, lose it due to dry macular degeneration. Wet macular degeneration, on the other hand, accounts for about 10% of cases, but it causes the greatest visual burden in our, um, in our aging patients. Um, the risk factors for macular degeneration, as we talked about, are increasing age uh, and genetics uh, and uh, cigarette smoking. So uh, only one of these is modifiable, cigarette smoking. So as ophthalmologists, uh, we do not recommend, uh, well, any, any physician is not going to recommend cigarette smoking, but it's particularly detrimental in patients with macular degeneration. Can't control our genetics. We can't control our age, but we can control that modifiable factor. Um, with regard to dry macular degeneration and the treatment of dry macular degeneration, antioxidant vitamins have been proven to benefit people with dry macular degeneration. And the formulation that is currently uh, most commonly used is the AREDS-2. It st stands for Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And it has clearly been shown to be beneficial in patients with dry macular degeneration in slowing the progression. Doesn't really improve vision, but it can slow the progression of macular degeneration. Recently, uh, there has been an approved injection treatment called Cyfovre for a select type of dry macular degeneration that has a condition called macular atrophy. Uh, this medication has just been approved within the past month or two, and there is, I would say, limited benefit in most patients with dry macular degeneration and no visual improvement. There is a suggestion that it slows the progression of this atrophic type of macular degeneration, but it does require an injection of a medication into the eye every month or two to slow that progression. And we'll, it's very early in its um, a market approval. And so we will know more about this as we uh, have opportunities to use it in patients. Uh, wet macular degeneration treatment. So with wet macular degeneration, what happens is an abnormal blood vessel grows underneath the retina, shouldn't be there, but it grows under the retina and leaks fluid and hemorrhage underneath the retina, and that causes damage to the cells in the back of the eye, the rods and cones in the retina, so they, they can't uh, function well. Uh, previous treatments involved laser uh, back 
25 and 30 years ago, we were doing laser for wet macular degeneration. But in general, these treatments were destructive for patients and they continued to lose vision. And sometimes they would lose vision just because we did the laser. Um, for the past two decades, I would say the greatest advance in the field of ophthalmology has been the development of injection therapies to not only prevent visual loss in wet macular degeneration, but it can actually, these, can, these treatments can actually restore vision. Uh, these treatments require a continuous series of intraocular injections to maintain and improve vision. They're typically done, uh, they can't monthly to every six weeks to every eight weeks. I have some patients that get these injections every three months uh, to help them maintain excellent visual acuity. Uh, prior to these injections, basically we had our hands were tied and most of the treatments would make patients worse. And so this has really been a huge benefit to the population of folks who get a wet macular degeneration. Uh, we individualize these treatments according to the patient's needs and to the amount of leakage that they have and the type of blood vessel they have. And the medications that we currently use are Avastin, Lucentis, Ilea, and Vibismo. The, the Vibismo is the most recently approved medication for, um, for wet macular degeneration. Um, talk a little bit about diabetic retinopathy. Uh, most of you are aware that there is an epidemic of diabetes in our uh, society. Uh, a lot of it is related to uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity, and, um, and it's very unfortunate. And unfortunately, diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of irreversible blindness in people under the age of 50, and it also can cause loss of vision in patients uh, in the senior uh, age group bracket. Diabetic retinopathy, uh, the blindness is caused by damage to the retina, where leaky blood vessels can cause swelling in the retina. That's a condition called diabetic macular edema. And in some cases, new blood vessels are forming in the back of the eye due to the poor blood flow that happens in diabetics. And they can develop, these new blood vessels are fragile and can bleed into the vitreous cavity and cause blindness. Um, how do we decrease the chance of diabetes causing loss of vision in patients? Well, optimizing control of blood sugar and maintaining good levels of uh, hemoglobin A1C decrease the risk of developing eye disease. Again, this is another one. Smoking is always a no-no, but it's a definite no-no in patients with diabetic retinopathy. And we use injection treatments laser and surgery to maintain and restore vision loss in patients affected by diabetic retinopathy. Uh, next condition I'll talk about is glaucoma. And uh, glaucoma is, a, what is the third leading cause of uh, blindness in industrialized societies in, in, in the United States. And glaucoma is a condition where the optic nerve develops damage and that damage is related to uh, intraocular pressure and high intraocular pressure. The eye has a pressure uh, that is normal pressure is between 12 and 20. And um, elevated intraocular pressures over prolonged periods of time can cause damage to the optic nerve. Uh, there are two types of glaucoma open angle, which is the most common type of glaucoma, and angle closure glaucoma. The open angle glaucoma in general has no symptoms and until advanced vision loss has occurred. And this is one of the conditions that is kind of a silent blinder. Patients may not know that they have uh, glaucoma because they don't have open angle glaucoma and so they aren't in a habit of going to see an ophthalmologist and getting their pressure checked. And some, some of these folks can come in with still a very good straight ahead vision, 20-20 vision straight ahead, but they've lost all of their peripheral vision such that driving is hazardous in these folks. And so it's, they lose visual field, 
And that's why they don't present early to the eye doctor. Fortunately, uh, these can be treated with topical, uh, glaucoma can be treated with topical drops or with laser or in advanced cases, surgery uh, can be performed for open angle glaucoma. Angle closure glaucoma, on the other hand, is a condition that presents um, very early in its course because it is characterized by extreme eye pain and redness and loss of vision and is initially treated with drops, but ultimately requires laser or surgical treatment to manage the intraocular pressure in open angle glaucoma. So I, I talked uh, a little bit about four common eye diseases. And like I said, there are many more, there are diseases of the cornea, there are diseases of the optic nerve, but I wanted to hit kind of the highlights, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about eye health um, before we go to our question and answer period. Uh, so in general, anything that promotes good overall health is good for the eyes. The eyes have blood vessels in them. Anything that promotes uh, good vascular health is important for good ocular health. So eating a balanced diet high in fruits and vegetables and nuts and fish maintaining proper weight. Uh, we talked about uh, not smoking or no, no tobacco. And um, another thing that uh, is not commonly thought of, but wearing protective lenses when doing high risk activities like woodworking. Um, trauma is a very common cause of loss of vision and hammering metal on metal, or anytime somebody's working out in the yard with a weed eater, uh, particles, things can fly off of that and cause severe loss of vision. So wearing protective lenses when you're involved in um, activities that are high risk is, is very important. And then getting routine eye exams. And so when is the time to get routine eye exams? Well, we'll get to that on our next slide. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends that uh, folks get an initial ocular exam at the age of 40. Um, if there is a predisposing health condition like hypertension or a family history of eye disease like glaucoma is present, then the first exam should be done earlier. Uh, children are screened for visual issues at typically at their school and are see, and then are if they fail their vision screening, they're um, appropriately referred to an ophthalmologist or an eye care provider to make sure to, to see that there aren't any pathologic conditions and that they can be put in the appropriate glasses. Type one diabetics sh should have an eye exam within five years of the diagnosis of diabetes and type two diabetics should have an eye exam at the time of diagnosis and then at least yearly. Um, at the age of 65, exams should be done at least every year or two or more frequently if an eye disease is present. Like I said, I have patients with macular degeneration that I see every four to five weeks. I have patients with dry macular degeneration who are relatively asymptomatic that may not need an appointment uh, perhaps only one time a year. So it needs to be individualized by uh, your eye care provider based on the findings of your examination. Um, this pretty much finishes my talk about uh, common eye diseases and eye health, but I wanted to finish by saying that um, Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist is uh, in the process of developing a new eye institute, and this is a rendering of that new eye institute um, that will be down in downtown Winston-Salem, where we will have ophthalmic operating rooms, and clinical space and uh, with tons of parking around it. So we're very excited about moving forward with, um, with our uh, new eye institute and you'll be hearing more about that in uh, future presentations. So Deb, that's all I have. I guess we can take the slides down perhaps and I'll stop and sharing. We will get to the questions that are already rolling in. I, I was pretty confident that they would. So, all right, now I'm gonna stumble over the pronunciations to some of this, so forgive me in advance. 
is surgery always the resolution to S-T-R-A-B-I-S-M-U-S? So strabismus is a misalignment of the eyes that I didn't talk about. So um, it's kind of, you can either have an eye that turns in, which is called esotropia, or an eye that turns out, which is called exotropia. Uh, surgery is um, indicated in some cases, but a number of cases can be handled with uh, prisms and eyeglasses that can uh, align uh, vision so double vision goes away. So surgery doesn't need to be done in everyone, in, in everyone that has strabismus, and this uh, problem is typically taken care of by um, pediatric ophthalmologists and uh, who also do adult strabismus or adult misalignment of the eyes. So not a, you don't always need surgery. Good question. Well, here's another question that kind of bounces off of that. If I have a cataract, do I have to have surgery immediately? So uh, absolutely not. Uh, people hear, oh, I have a cataract and think, okay, I've got to get this cataract taken out. Everybody has different visual needs and lots of people with cataract uh, still have excellent vision. You can have 20, 20, cataract just means yellowing of the lens. And by the time someone is in their fifties or sixties, everybody has some yellowing of the lens, but people can have vision even better than 2020 with cataracts. So it's not necessary to have cataracts just because you have cataract. It's when cataract, it's when your vision is affecting your quality of life or your activities of daily living that uh, you, we consider doing cataract surgery in patients. Okay, this was kind of long, but it's very timely with the uh, smoke from Canada. I have glaucoma and have had infections in the past year and one blockage of oil glands and currently have an infection that may be the result of the smoke recently. What can you suggest for women who wear eye makeup so that it doesn't cause any eye issues? I love my eye makeup, but I can't wear it now while I can barely see due to the infection. Yeah, so uh, that's another condition that we really did speak about. And the glaucoma is an ind independent factor in that uh, with that particular question. But um, as so we all have uh, tear glands that line our eyelids. And sometimes the, uh, these tear glands can become blocked off and the, the eyelid tissue swells and becomes red and inflamed. And that's the typical sty or chalazion. And it can also be associated with a condition that we call blepharitis, which is kind of a dandruff of the eyelids. And in general, the first line of treatment in those patients is, um, we'll suggest that they take a drop of Johnson's baby shampoo and a drop of water and take a Q-tip and scrub on the eyelids to get those dandruff flakes off. And then we use hot compresses. So a hot washcloth uh, that you're not hot like you put in a microwave or not boiling water, but hot tap water and you hold it up to, to that area. And lots of times that will allow those uh, tear glands to drain and uh, can be very effective. Another thing that ha that is associated with that is having dry eye. And as we, um, again, as, as we age, we don't make as many tears as we made previously. And so lots of times we need to use lubricating drops that are over the counter to improve, um, to Im uh, improve the ocular surface so vision can improve and also makes these lid um, styes and chalazion uh, less likely to occur. Okay. And um, I want to ask people that are raising their hands, if you can put the questions in the chat, that's how, or the Q&A, that's how I can read them and then um, ask Dr. Grevin to respond. So do you recommend eye vitamins or other supplements such as, and again, I'm sorry, bilberry for uh, people with glaucoma? So the, uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, glaucoma is not a condition that has been shown to be a, uh, influenced by eye vitamins or supplements like bilberry. Um, macular degeneration is the typical um, is, is the disease that is impacted by using eye vitamins. 
Um, Bill Berry in, in the lay press is something that has been suggested to be effective for, um, but there's no scientific data on that. Um, and so I would say that I don't think you're going to harm yourself by taking bilberry, but there's no scientific evidence that it is efficacious for um, any eye disease. Okay. What causes starburst glares after cataract surgery? So uh, that's a great question. Lots of people have cataract surgery because when they have cataracts, they do get this glare uh, from oncoming headlights or looking at light street lights across the street. And that's an indication that the cataract is affecting them. Uh, and when we take cataracts out, um, sometimes we are letting a lot more light into the eyes. So the eye is maybe sensitized or super sensitized to this type of glare. Uh, that secondary cataract that I talked about a little bit where I, uh, it, after the cataract slide that we talked about, that's another common cause after cataract surgery. Uh, and, and that uh, can be helped with laser. But, you know, sometimes we, we can't ever make things like they used to be, right? I mean, it, it, there oftentimes, even after perfect cataract surgery, uh, folks will notice some glare. And um, so it, it's, it is unfortunate, but um, sometimes there are, we can fix things and sometimes we have to live with them. The next one is, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Does using, does regular using of sunglasses prevent, again, P-R-E-S-B-Y-O-P-L-A? Okay, so that's presbyopia. So presbyopia is the, the inability to read and when we get in our 40s and 50s and needing the little half reading glasses. And, uh, you know, I, I debated as to whether I should put you wearing sunglasses for ocular health. Um, because, and there, there's, there's some literature out there that you can read that says that you need to get UVA and UVB blocking lenses uh, to help the health of your retina. But it turns out your cornea and your lens blocks about 99.5% of UVA and UVB blocking. So I think sunglasses are an important adjunct for comfort and but they, they certainly don't pre prevent presbyopia. Okay. And actually that was the second question. How important is wearing sunglasses? So I think you've addressed that. I think, I think it's, I think it's important. I think it's not the most important thing. Yeah. Is a person's risk for macular degeneration increased after developing a macular hole? The hole was repaired immediately upon being diagnosed. So a macular hole is another condition that we see. They occur in about one in 5,000 people. So relic, like macular degeneration, much less common, where the jelly in the eye pulls on the center of the retina and causes a defect in the retina. And so people go from normal vision to 2200 vision or legal blindness. We have an operation now called a vitrectomy that we've been doing since the late 80s, where we repair that macular hole by putting a gas bubble in the eye and taking the vitreous jelly out. And the patient has to look down at the floor for several days to a week to get the retina to smooth back out. Uh, but it is not a risk factor for getting macular degeneration. The same area of the retina is involved, the macula, but it's a totally different disease process. But they can occur together, but it doesn't cause it. Okay. Should eye exams be done by ophthalmologist or exams by optometrist sufficient? So I, th I think that um, healthcare is a team sport. And I think that if you, I think optometrists uh, today are very well trained at recognizing eye diseases. And so I think a routine eye exam, we, we employ several optometrists here at Wake Forest. They are our colleagues and partners. If they see something that is not exactly right, they know to refer to us. We've used the same medical record. So I think op optometrists are different than ophthalmologists and that ophthalmologists are surgically trained and optometrists are trained medically. 
Um, but I think for routine screening exams and following up on uh, diseases, oftentimes in conjunction with an ophthalmologist, that's how we do things here. They're perfectly appropriate. And I just want to remind everyone that I'm, I'm so grateful to Dr. Grevin for hanging in here, answering some of these questions. So officially we end at 630, but we, we don't want to end until we have addressed all of your questions. So thank you all. Okay, we have another question here. What is narrow angle glaucoma? How is it treated? So that was what I was uh, referring to. There's open angle glaucoma and angle closure or narrow angle glaucoma. And the narrow angle glaucoma, uh, if you present with a red painful eye, then uh, we use drops to get the pressure down. And then ultimately we do a laser procedure, what's called a laser uh, peripheral iridotomy to correct that condition. Uh, the key is if you see, uh, if your eye care provider sees that you're at high risk for narrow angle or angle closure glaucoma, they can do this laser procedure before you develop the symptoms of pain and prevent that from ever happening. So, but the treatment is typically with a laser, sometimes a surgical iridotomy is required or iridectomy. What about thick cornea, which shows higher pressure? So that, that's a good question. So the, um, when we check an eye pressure in our examination lanes, if, um, if you have a thick cornea, your pressure can measure uh, higher than it, it, norm, it actually is. And so, um, like I said, normal pressure is 12 to 21 or 22. 22 could be high for some people because everybody has variance toler various tolerances, but knowing the thickness of the cornea is important in uh, determining what the real pressure is, not the measured pressure. So that's a really great question. Very sophisticated question, I would say right there. Well, I wish I'd ask it because I, there's nothing about me that's sophisticated. Do you recommend eye wash? How often, if at all? Um, so I would say in general, I don't think we need to wash our eyes. Uh, I do recommend in a number of my patients with artificial teardrops, which is kind of a type of eye wash that keeps the eye lubricated. Uh, but in general, I don't feel like, like that is a, um, a routine ma health maintenance uh, procedure that needs to be performed, unless you're having symptoms or your doctor suggests you do that. Okay, I'm going to read this question exactly as it's written. It took my second cataract 16 years to ripen. Which eye drops do you recommend for dry eyes? Okay, so... Uh, that, that exactly points to one of the points we made earlier, the questions that was earlier. Uh, you know, everybody has a little bit of cataract by the time you get to be 60. I'm in my 60s and I don't, I have 2010 vision better than 2020 vision, but I have, I'm, I know I have a little bit of cataract. So if somebody told you you had cataract at age 65 and you didn't have to have it taken out to 81, it, that, that would be 16 years. It means that, um, you know, people can function extremely well with an eye that has a little bit of cataract in it. So everybody progresses at different rates. And when I tell somebody you have a cataract, you might need it done in two years, or it might be 22 years. That's kind of a very common thing that I'll tell my patients. Um, I don't have any real preference in terms of eye drop, eye, uh, lubricating eye drops, sustain and refresh uh, seem to work really well in my patients, but there are a number of different artificial teardrops out there. Okay, are there night eyeglasses to reduce glare while driving? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a paradox, right? Because at night, we need to get more light into our eyes. And so wearing anything that is going to decrease the amount of light or to decrease the amount of glare is going to decrease uh, maybe our functioning and not seeing, you know, not seeing in our periphery quite as well. So I would say uh, there aren't any specific night glasses uh, that um, will improve that glare uh, that aren't 
going to compromise your your vision and seeing things coming in at the sides and things like that. So. Well, and the last comment is thank you for the macular clarification. You provided some relief and for a very informative presentation. Well, so, that's very, very Revin, kind thank to say. You. I was just going to add one thing. That sure. Sometimes people think that macular degeneration is relentlessly progressing. And if you have it, you're going to go blind. And that's not true. I have patients that I saw 30 years ago who were in their 70s who had dry macular degeneration. And I've seen them into their 90s and they still can maintain 20 to 20, 25 vision. Um, but some people will lose vision. So I think that that's sometimes people hear that and they think it's a kind of a death sentence for their vision. And I, I wanted to make that point earlier and I didn't. So, but anyway, thank you for those kind uh, comments. Oh, and one more question. Okay. Sorry. Are people with autoimmune diseases at risk for getting early cataract or glaucoma? Anything they need to have a heads up? Yeah, great question. So autoimmune diseases uh, are sometimes associated with a type of eye disease called uveitis or inflammation. You get inflammation in your joints or you get inflammation in your bowel, but you can get inflammation in your eyes as well. Uh, lots of these diseases are treated with steroids. Steroids uh, uh, increase the risk of cataract development and also increase the risk of uh, glaucoma. So people with autoimmune diseases should get uh, routine eye exams, uh, particularly those who are on steroid medications because they can impact uh, someone's vision. Great question. Perfect. Well, Dr. Grevin, I think that's it. I am so grateful that you could spend this evening with us. And I'm grateful to all of you for joining us in June and make a date, July 11th for our next Aging Well presentation. Until then, be safe, have fun, and age well.